Thus, all inquiries on God, which are unknown to the disciple, may be made from the qualified spiritual master. And here the practical example is set by Mars Prickett. So, in other words, uh, there's also a kind of, um, you know, this is a, a, just their behavior, even though this is actually happening, he was actually cursed, Sukadev Goswami is actually very enthusiastic to preach to him, even though he's a worldly man, he sees that this is a great soul who's um, asked intelligent questions and is qualified. He wasn't going to just sit down with anyone, especially a king or an emperor. And, um, uh, but there, this is a play also. And, and you know, they're showing us what is the right way to approach a spiritual master? What are the right kind of questions to ask? Like, not like, you know, oh, can my wife and I live together forever? Can you do something like that? This was a question that some famous personality asked Prabhupada. You know, John and Yoko, they wanted to be together forever. I would say it's impossible. You know, don't, don't ask stupid questions. I mean, to ask something that's meaningful and that's um, going to actually help you to progress on your spiritual path, not to maintain your illusion of so-called so material happiness. Um, so here they're showing us how to ask and what to ask and many other things as well. They're the perfect uh, example. Much like Arjuna with Krishna. <clears throat> Thus all these inquiries on God, which are unknown to the disciple, may be made from the qualified spiritual master. And here the practical example is set by Mars Prickett. It was, however, already known to Mars Cricket that everything we see is born of the energy of the Lord. As we have all learned in the very beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, Jaman Jashayataha. So Maharaj Cricket wanted to know the process of creation. The origin of creation was known to him. Otherwise, he would not have inquired how the, how the personality of God, it, by his different energies, creates this phenomenal world. The common man also knows that the creation is made of some creator, made by some creator, and is not created automatically. You know, so that actually, this, man, this point just came to uh, my mind. That this is actually after, I, don't, I remember all the, you know, uh, the whole chronological order of things, but the basic uh, first part of the, you know, uh, first and second canon was, Mars Brickett is been cursed, and he's uh, by a 13-year-old, 12, 13-year-old son of a Brahmin who's immature, and he, it was not correct for him to curse, curse the emperor of the world for such a minor offense. And um, he now is, um, instead of trying to reverse it, he's actually accepted as a blessing, not a, not a, a reversal. Fortune. I mean, if you, can you just imagine somebody like Doria Dome? I mean, he was willing to fight to the end. You know, he wanted that that empire more than anything. He was willing to sacrifice. How many? I've been asking all morning. How many people were killed in the battle for etc.? It's like I've like eighteen million or something. Six hundred forty million. Six hundred forty million. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, you know, Duryodhan was not going to just sit by and let some 13-year-old boy stand in his way. And Krishna well, didn't want Arjuna to just roll over either. He wanted, the, he wanted to show um, his, uh, that he's the creator, he's, he's in charge, that he's the, 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 the creator of this material world, and he will say who should be running things on this planet. And... Um, so after all of that, all of that 
bloodshed and all of that stress and anxiety and fighting. Um, you know, when Arjuna is perplexed whether to do it, then after it's done and all the bodies have piled up, Eudice is feeling tremendously uh, guilty about the whole thing, and so much so that nobody can satisfy him, not even the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The only person who can satisfy him is Grandfather Bhishma, who's lying on a bed of arrows. Every inch of his body is pierced with arrows. He's lying there, and Yudhisthira comes and says, I'm really feeling, you know, of course it's a really big thing, you know, that you were responsible for so many people's death and caused so much suffering to the wives and sisters and mothers and children of those people killed. But still, the grandfather of is lying on a bed of arrows. I think he's suffering also. But he, he's happy to um, answer those questions and help him overcome his grief. And especially since the Supreme Personality of God is standing right there at the moment of his death. This was a great boon on his part. But again, the point is, is that, so all of that, all of that drama went on to install the Pandavas. And then, just after a few decades, they all um, pass it on to their um, nephew, uh, Perkid Maharaj. And I'm not sure how long he ruled, but I don't think it was very long. You know, it doesn't appear to be, but I, I can't give you an exact time. Maybe someone here has more knowledge about it than me. But the point is, is that he just, because of this curse, he immediately thinks, this is great, now I know exactly when I'm going to die. Because I know he has an empire. He has pa not just a palace, he has palaces with so much opulence. With, you know, there's nothing to compare to today. The walls are in, uh, encrusted, or in, in, in the walls are embedded, you know, emeralds, rubies, sapphires, diamonds. This, and, that, and those jewels is what lights the darkness. He has not just a few horses, he has herds of first-class horses, elephants. He has many wives, beautiful wives. He has all the wealth of his empire that everybody fought so high and hard for. And he's ready to just say, okay, this is a blessing, I've been cursed, I can, get I can now prepare for the ultimate test, which is to go back home, back to God, to see the Supreme Personality of God. That vision which he had in the womb, that's the vision that he's been looking for. It's so gratifying, it's so satisfying to see the form of the Lord. So many people that we know, Dhruva Maharaj, Pallad Maharaj, they all describe the vision of the Lord. Um, there's so many beautiful prayers all throughout the Bhagavatam. The people that see the lotus feet of the Lord, to see the form of the Lord, uh, it, that's all that they're hankering after. Narada Muni, they're all ready to give up everything just to keep that vision. And so he's ready to throw away the whole empire, even after all of that has happened, to sit down on the bank of a river, to talk to a, 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 a mendicant who's not wearing anything, scattered hair, probably a little matted, I would imagine. Although everybody says he looks very beautiful, like a young boy. And, um, and so, and, and the, fir the, the, the first part of his inquiries are, what is the duty of an intelligent man knowing he's on the threshold of death? That's already been answered just prior to this. And so Sukadev goes home and says, Well, like, the, 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 this is a very intelligent question, and the answer is that you should meditate on the Supreme Personality of God, hear and chant the glories of the Supreme Lord. And so, what does he ask after that? Does he ask about the intimate pastimes of the Supreme Personality of God? No, the first thing he asks about is, how great is God? Just how does he create this incredible material, this material creation, which to Krishna, this is just a fragment of his energy. It's insignificant. And he wants to know, how great is God? You know, we know from our uh, Judeo-Christian background that, you know, God is great. 
Well, how great? And, now, and so how did he create? In the Bible, we have, I just thought about this this morning, I didn't get a chance to do any look into it, but <clears throat> you know, it says that the creation was made in seven days. But actually there's also, there's a, um, in the beginning, there's, in the beginning there was the Word and the Word was God. And then it talks about the seven days. And then the first day was, what was it? It was light, huh? Light and darkness. I think that was the second day. I'm not sure. Yeah. But anyway, what was the first day? The firmament? Light. It was light. It was just, yeah, light. And then the firmament of the heavens. Then I think there was a separation of day and light. And then it was like the trees, the creepers, you know, the plants and so on. And then it goes on from there. And um, so that, that's, a, you know, obviously, as Prabhupada just said, that this is a natural thing to ask. How has this place been created? And who's created it? And to find out how God, how great is God. He's not, he doesn't have much time. But he's, show, he's doing this for our benefit. He's trying to, and, and to show us that you don't immediately drum, jump to the Vrindavan. Uh, Gokula pastimes or Goloka pastimes, the pastimes of the gopis. That's, um, you, one must first understand all the aspects of the Supreme Personality of God and we're beginning to be described to us step by step by step. So, um, anyway, I was just, you know, I, it just, based on what he just said, all of a sudden was, I was thinking, I just, you know, it's amazing. He's ready to just sit down on the bank of a river and talk to this naked sadhu about the creation of this material universe. Uh, not try to save his empire and his opulence and his material comforts. He's, he, he's ready. He knows there's something much higher than this. Uh, anyone have any questions or comments at this point? Okay. Um, the origin of creation was known to him, otherwise he would not have inquired uh, how the Supreme Personality of God it, by his different energies creates this phenomenal world. The common man also knows that the creation is made by some creator and is not created automatically. We have no experience in the practical world that a thing is created automatically. Foolish people say that the creative energy is independent and acts automatically as electrical energy works. But the intelligent man, intelligent man knows that even the electrical energy is generated by an expert engineer in the localized powerhouse. And how, and thus, the energy is distributed everywhere under the resident and engineer's supervision. The Lord's supervision in connection with creation is mentioned even in the Bhagavad Gita 910 and, it's clearly, and it is clearly said there that material energy is a manifestation of one of, one of many such energies of the Supreme, per, Supreme. Parasya Shakti Vivitaiva Suyate. The 910 is Majaj Jaksena Prakriti Suyati Satcharacharam Hetuna Nena Kanteya Jagatni Bhavivartate. This material nature of mine is working under my direction. And, um, uh, using the, the non-moving and moving living entities, they're all working under my control. And, and um, so, and Krishna declares this to Arjuna in the ninth chapter. Uh, an ex inexperienced boy may be struck with wonder by seeing the impersonal actions of electronics, as many other wonderful things, conducted by electrical energy, but an experienced man knows that behind the action is a living man who creates such energy. In this regard, Prabhupada, um, I heard a lecture recently where Prabhupada, on that verse, Majajak Sena Prakriti 9.10, he was talking about how he gave some examples. And one of them was that when he was a boy, uh, the electric fan, um, he when he saw it moving, he thought there must be a ghost uh, making it move. And then um, he gave the ex another example of, he called it the gramophone. 
I guess that would be a record player, mm -hmm. my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So he thought that there was another little man inside there who was singing something. And, and then he gave this other example, uh, apparently, of a, a young boy who, when he heard the, the drum, the sounds coming from the drum, he started to cut the drum open to see where that person was, see what kind of a person was inside the drum. So, in other words, children will think, who is behind this fan? Who is behind this light? Where is it coming from? So, similarly, in the material world, we look at the material creation, we just don't uh, automatically think, ah, it's just happening, you know, it's not, it's no big thing, no, no big deal, you know, it just happens this way. Like, uh, there's the example where Prabhupada sa says that Sarup Dhamadar uh, was at a, uh, a seminar and this man was claiming that we understand now what chemicals um, create life. It was amino acids and things like that. So Sarup Dhamadar uh, raised his hand and spoke and said, asked him, uh, well, if we were to give you those chemicals right now, could you produce life? And this, the scientist said, well, not at this point, you know, uh, in, in the future, a post data check. And um, so, um, this is the kind of, uh, <clears throat> this is the kind of uh, way that Prabhupada wanted us to challenge the scientists, because they're trying to say that the material nature is what's going, and even, even Prabhupada would make this point, even if you that say that's all true, well, who, and you could create life, who produced, who created the chemicals? Where did they come from? Nothing comes, nothing we know comes from nothing. Everything is coming from something, from someone. Someone has created. And, um, but they're, you know, trying to say that there was nothing, and then there was something. It's like saying, all of a sudden, I go outside, and there's an elephant. There was no elephant before, but then there was an elephant. It just created itself. You know, th this is ridiculous. It's absurd. Something is creating these things. And that something is the personality of Godhead. And he, but he doesn't necessarily create himself. He has agents that do things for him. It's his energies, and he has various demigods who are helping him in his creation. So, uh, anything else? Anyone have anything? Yes? I just had a cute story um, I heard years ago. Um, you know how we always tell the children that the only is with their heart. And uh, this one mother brought her son to the doctor, and the doctor said, Would you like to hear your heart? So he put the stethoscope to his heart, and the child looks up at his mom. He's playing the redundant. <laughs> <laughs> <And he's not. laughs> Playing the Merdanga. You know, God's in your heart. And he's playing the Merdanga. <laughs> and it's like, you're going on in my heart. Yeah. And yet, so, and so these are things that Prabhupada, we, we, by taking to this process of bhakti yoga, we've declared war on the material energy, which is working under his control. So, uh, but, his material energy also has the service to try to protect him from fools and rascals. And um, we are born fools and rascals, and that's why we need a spiritual master. Um, so we declare war on the material energy and, and all of our past um, misconceptions and all of our past um, Desires. We, we now want to learn how to desire. We want to learn how to act. We want to learn how to think. We don't, we don't want to stay in illusion. And we don't know how to desire. And we literally, we're caught up in a network of desires. And it's very entangled. And we actually have a desire tree in our heart. I mean, the Supreme Personality of God it. You pray to him, and he, you, if based on your, your whether you deserve, you know your your desire and your qualification, he will gradually fulfill your desires. Uh, so we have to know how to desire. We have to know what to ask for. 
We have to know how to, we have to learn how to talk to God, how to talk to Krishna. So we have to have a good strategy. If we declare, you're in a battle, you have to have a good strategy. How, and what are the enemies? And so these things we can discuss. But um, that's what is the, the significance of studying the Bhagavad Gita, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and the Srimad Bhagavatam, nectar destruction, nectar devotion. They give us injections of uh, spiritual energy. They give us injections of the truth that gradually, as Mahaji yesterday was discussing, when you hear from the spiritual master, it's like a, you, I, you said, I like what you said, it was like you know, a, a bolt of light waking us up, opening our eyes. Om again to Maranda Shakyananjana Salakaya. Chaksura Ummilitam Jana Tazma Shri Guru Vena Maha. We're born in darkness, complete ignorance, and the spiritual master injects the truth into our ear hole. Otherwise, the ear holes, as it said in the previous chapter, are just like snake holes. And the talking is just like the croaking of these frogs out here. <coughs> the first interesting. Yep, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Connie. No, uh, yes. Anyway, and that's interesting that Subhag Swami, when he walked out outside to start chanting, he said, I asked him if he wanted me to walk with him, and he went, this was after the Mongol Arctic and everything, because you don't know your way around. He said, no, I'll just end up talking to you, watch him around. He went as far as the like gazebo there, and he came back and he said, they're frogs. I said, yeah, there's a lot of frogs. They're croaking. I said, yeah, I know. They're calling snakes. Are there snakes? <laughs> he was afraid he was going to get, yeah, there's some snakes, but I didn't know. Is it poisonous? It's, yeah, there's poisonous. I'm not poisonous. No problem. Don't worry. You'll be all right. But still, they, he immediately thought of, I, I did the same thing. I mean, we got a, a, rented a house in Tennessee, and there was some ponds, and I was just noticing how much how many frogs there were. And I said, ask the, the caretaker of, oh, there, are, there are a lot of snakes. No, no, it's not. <laughs> so well, I, I, I've heard that when you hear frogs, it's, they're snakes. Mm -hmm. Because we immediately were trained like that, to think like that. So, anyway, I'll continue reading here. Uh, if I can remember what it was. Um, uh, Okay, as an inexperienced boy may be struck with wonder by seeing the impersonal actions of electronics or many other wonderful things conducted by electrical energy, but an inexperienced man knows that behind the action is a living man who creates such energy. Similarly, the so-called scholars and philosophers of the world may be may by mental speculation uh, present so many utopian theories about the impersonal creation of the universe. But an intelligent devotee of the Lord, by studying the Bhagavad Gita, can know that behind the creation is the hand of the Supreme Lord, just as in the generating electrical powerhouse, there is the resident engineer. The research scholar finds out the cause and the effect of everything, but research scholars are as great as Brahma, Shiva, Indra, and many other demigods are sometimes bewildered by seeing the wonderful creative energies of the Lord. Um, so what to speak of the tiny mundane scholars dealing in petty things? As there are differences in living conditions of different planets uh, of the universe, and as one planet is superior to others, the brains of the living entities in those respective planets are also different categorical values. Of, they're also of different categorical values. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, one can compare the long duration of life of the inhabitants of Brahma's planet, which is inconceivable to the inhabitants of this planet Earth, due to the categorical value of the brain of Brahmaji also inconceivable to any great scientist of this planet. And with such high brain power, even Brahmaji has described in his great Samhita, Brahma Samhita 5.1, as follows, 
ईश्वर परम कृष्ण सच्चिदानंद विग्रह अनादि राधे गोविंद सर्व कारण काम There are many personalities possessing the qualities of Bhagwan but Krishna is the supreme cause none can excel him he is the supreme person and his body is eternal full of knowledge and bliss he is the primeval lord govind and the cause of all causes what time is it 8:20 8:20 oh i can read another paragraph and uh, this will be to another big long paragraph after that but i'll just read this by brahmaji admits lord krishna to be the supreme cause of all causes but persons with tiny brains within the petty planet earth think of the lord as one of them thus when the lord says in the bhagavad gita that he lord krishna is all in all the speculative philosophers and the mundane wranglers deride him and the lord regretfully says avajananti mam mudha munus manushyam tanu ashvitam param bhavam ajananto mama bhuta maheshwaram fools to ride me when i descend as in the human form they do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be bhagavad gita 911 that's the first that uh, follows the um majajak sena property verse number that i just quoted brahma and shiva and what to speak of other demigods are bhutas or powerful created demigods who manage universal affairs much like ministers appointed by a king the ministers may be ishwaras or controllers but the supreme lord is mahash maheshwara or the creator of the controllers persons with a poor fund of knowledge do not know this and therefore they have the audacity to deride him because he comes before us by his causeless mercy occasionally as a human being the lord is not like a human being he is satchidananda vigraha or the absolute personality god is and there is no difference between the body and the soul he is both the power and the powerful i mean they think that he krishna is just an ordinary man or they think that nan can achieve god they can become gods uh which both are ridiculous i remember that there were some uh groups you know back in the in the 70s there were a lot of you know different yoga um gurus and, and so one of the questions they would always ask is um uh, well can god make me god and you know what the answer is to that well he didn't have to be made so he's still superior to you so maybe he could make you a god but he didn't need to be made he was born he arrived in the cell of devaki and vasudev in his complete you know uh god uh personality four hands conchell club lotus disc garland did jewelry flashing his opponents around the room helmet and he was god on the lap of mother to soda when she looked in to see if there was dirt in his mouth she sees the universal creation when he when he took uh put in his breast and took her milk and also took her life he was god all throughout from the very beginning until the end he's always god and not just a demi god this is he without this this whole material energy is just a fragmental portion it's very insignificant to him and he does it with such effortlessly there's so many miraculous things that we take for granted i mean one seed will packed up in that seed will not only be an apple tree but an apple orchard and this seed there'll be rose bushes and then the fragrance of the beautiful rose and the delicious taste of the apple another seed will give you you know a mango tree and but it's you just put it in the earth these magic seeds you put them in the earth with a little water a little loving devotion and sunlight if the soil is proper prop has the proper nutrition uh nutrients it will produce different um fruits vegetables flowers and this is just you know just another small part of the lord's creation yes 
Whenever I've been in India, even though I'm at the temple, when you leave, you know, go to Calcutta or something, and just across the street, whatever, it just seems to me like the great big festivals, everyone celebrates Durga Puja, everyone yeah. celebrates Shivaratri. Wow. But I I don't hear outside of outside of Iskon, I don't hear about anyone celebrating Janmashtami or Gorpani. I feel like uh, am I am I right in saying that? Because I I feel like you know they celebrate like twelve days or something for Durga Puja. But you mean in India? Yeah. It's a national holiday. And yeah. and I I don't see the same well, around the well, just like Christmas, even Christmas Day is kind of. Well, they, they they want material opulence. That's that. It's for material opulence. Mm -hmm. they, and Krishna means you know. Give up. <laughs> yeah. Well, what what is it? Was it Jamuna? One of them said, uh, "If you, you know, don't go down to see that beautiful boy playing his flute. Don't listen to his flute playing." Because you'll lose all your material, uh, op you know, all your material wealth, everything. He'll take it all away, but he'll give you himself. And that, um, is, there's no price you can put on that. So yeah, I, I I can't really speak to that because I'm not so expert on what's co the culture of India. But I my understanding is mainly that they're interested in. You know, attaining a good job, a good wife, husband, uh, good wealth, health, like that. And, you know, whereas the Krishna Bhaktas, they're interested mainly in uh, developing pure love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When I go on the computer, and sometimes they'll show the different festivals. What I notice, like you're saying, the, the Indians come to. Mayapur, Gopin, I mean, it's like huge. There's like so many people wanting to see, you know, Panchatapa deities. And, yeah. And, or when Jamasmi, you know, you see the different the, uh, Indians coming. So that was part of what was wanting. Just, yeah, that was just wanting. Wanting the, the, the Indian population come to these temples because they, they, they will give them that opportunity to celebrate and to Right, and and now the actually the Indian government has just ruled that um, you know the, some kind of it gave the property the Mayapur property uh, some kind of uh, religious um, you know they they in the past under the communist government they were we were fighting against them and they weren't giving us um, so much support and now they're giving all support and they. have also made plans to build a four-lane highway from Calcutta to Manipur, mm -hmm. which is Before amazing. There was, before there was a restriction on the acreage, yeah. That, yeah. And, but it, that's been lifted and it's like 10, 10 and 15 times the amount. Yeah, what, what, there were 700 acres, <laughs> but I just read in something somewhere, um, it's pretty, uh, solid uh, authorization. I read somewhere something. Uh, no, it was something on this one that we had 700 acres in a kind of like network of deeds, but we could, it was really, you know, a way of having Iskon have that property, cause, but they wouldn't let us have title. And now they've released that and allowed us to, you know, there was a limitation on how much land you could own. And now they've said, no problem, uh, you can have these 700 acres that have been titled. We had one section that was Discount's title, but the other 700, and that's a lot for, that, for India. And it's the value, the dollar value is enormous. But I, I, even the last time I went, 2005, I, um, I was at the ticket counter, getting ready to leave, I think. And, um, I mentioned where I just come from, and some of the young girls were kind of like, you know, just kind of like cynical about the whole thing. And then one of them said, "No, no, this is real." And she starts speaking to them in Bengali, and they're going, "Oh," they, they had a lot of respect for 
the Mayapur project and what we were doing. So, uh, yeah, that is part of Prabhupada's plan, and you know, I haven't been ten years, so I don't really know, but it sounds like things are, you know, slowly coming around to his way of thinking. You know, so, but the, you know, those things culturally, just like, you know, for us, as my Prabhupada said, when I thought to come here and preach about no meat eating, no intoxication, no illicit sex, no gambling, just chant Hare Krishna, I thought it was impossible. And, and the thing is, it, culturally, it, it, it is impossible. Because, I mean, people didn't think that there was anything wrong with going to a baseball game and having a hot dog. That was part of our culture. Having a barbecue in the backyard. You know, I'm married. Why can't I have sex with my wife? What are you talking about? You know, I mean, the Catholics were supposed to be, you know, practicing a, a kind of, you know, for procreation, but even that was... So, I mean, no intoxication. What's wrong with having a good beer and watching a ball game? This was, even my father did it, my grandfather did it, and that's the way it was, and we like it. And it's nothing sinful. Like, what are you telling me? My life is sinful? And so to, to make that reverse, so similarly in India, over these, you know, it's for so long, people have been worshipping the various demigods for, at least they have a sense of, um, that it isn't just a, you know, go out there and, you know, they understand that there are demigods controlling things. But, you know, it says in uh, the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita that you have to, you know, have your, uh, you, we have to be focused. Specifically, you know, we want to focus on one thing and that, or that one person, and that's Krishna. You know, those persons whose intelligence are focused, um, are, they, they have, what is it, um, forget what the exact terminology, uh, you, you become, um, you know, fixed in purpose, that's it, you become fixed in purpose, you become, you concentrate on Krishna, those who are thinking of various other branches of the Vedas, their resolute, their, their determination is irresolute, it's like many branches of a river, you know, yes? Yeah, just, uh... I just remember there was listening to a lecture yesterday and it was said the lecture was uh, very it was mostly about the, how Christian consciousness is not hindered at all. And it was said that uh, they stated that uh, whatever people worship in India and other demigods or something, they can't compare it to Krishna worship because Krishna is like uh Supreme Percent of that I think he's not part of Hinduism like he's much higher than this. Right. And also it's it, I mean was quoted that he was saying that Krishna Bhakti is very rare, so there's some people aspiring for perfection, but Krishna devotees they are very rare, so it's not a wonder that people don't celebrate his birthday yes. so much. But at the same time, I mean, you feel offended because Indians sometimes they still worship Krishna, but they worship him as demigod, like like as an incarnation of Vishnu. So they still have Krishna that much more celebrated, but with the wrong word, because we worship him as Bhagavan and they worship him as the demigod. And there's, there was a, there's a verse, I, I'm not sure if it was in towards the end of the last chapter, it was like, Karma Savakava Va Moksha Kam Udaladi Tivraina Bhakti Yugena Yujeta Purusham Puram. Whether you have no desires, whether you're filled with the desires, or you desire liberation, you, whatever your desire is, you should engage in bhakti yoga, ti reina bhakti yoga, with full force and concentration. Because Krishna will purify you, and, and He ultimately fulfills even the, the. If you're worshiping a demigod, that demigod has to go to Krishna to fulfill your desire. The desire tree is in our heart. But we have to know how to desire. And we have to know how. To, you know, we have, we, we have to like, you know, have a planner, a plan. You know, you have to have a strategy. How am I going to, you know, when people go on a diet or they want to, you know, improve their health or uh, economic situation, you know, money's tight, they have to plan, have a budget, which is like poison for some people. I have to have a budget on how I'm going to spend money. I can't just spend whatever I want. So, um, get whatever I want. So, you know, you have to have some plan. 
And similarly, we're, we, we've embarked on one of the most rigorous, this is like, you know, people when they want to climb the Him uh, Mount Everest, they go, there's so many months of planning and so many things have to be considered and you have to train for it. You know, this is nothing. You know, the people that want to fly up to the moon, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a rocket or something. So many years of practice and planning and, and training. So we're, what we've set the highest goal. We're going to free ourselves from lifetimes of material desires, subtle and gross. Free ourselves from, and understand what is actually beneficial for us. We don't even know what's beneficial. We don't know what's really the right thing to do. And, and you know, I'm speaking about myself as well. I'm, you know, I feel like I've just begun. I mean, I, I and, I, you know, even though I've been around, sometimes I've just been loitering. You know, I'm not really applying myself the way I should. So, uh, there's always these things. I mean, I don't have to get into a whole other thing, but um, uh, I was listening to someone talk about Sajana Toshin, written by Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati. And he's mentioning about um, lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and envy, which is some of our enemies. Uh, lust is in anger. Anger and lust are in greed. Anger, lust, greed are in illusion, anger, lust, greed, delusion are in pride, and all of them are in envy. Now you can take one by one those things and start to deal with them, but if we just eliminate envy, and if you look up the de definition of envy, it means uh, it's a feeling of resentment, you know, of, of someone else's qualities or someone else's possessions, and you feel as if it's a longing, you need that, I want that. I want what you got. I want what you have, yes. And when you can conquer that, and when you can actually see it in yourself. I mean, every day I shed enough, I try to, sometimes I add another false ego, but you have to shed, you, you're not, we don't see ourselves. We may think that we're, you know, I may think that I actually am helping people or I've actually realized, but I, you know, I may be doing it with the wrong mood or the wrong, you know, approach or the more wrong uh, tone, you know, or I feel superior because I know something. You know, uh, we have to be so careful how, how we um, approach our lives every day. But every day is a new challenge and we should never allow anything, I just heard Malachi when she was talking about this Prabhu um, Ram Das's stroke, and she said, we shouldn't ever become discouraged. We should never allow, because that's just another one of Maya or Kali's um, tools to hold us back. We're on the path, and you know, when you're running a marathon, there's going to be a lot of uh, obstacles, um, but you have to be determined. And you know, my coach, I remember when we'd be practicing, or I would be running a race, I could hear him. He'd be running on the infield. He'd come running up the, at the turn. He goes, It's there if you want it! You know, it's there if you want it. If you want it, it's there. Not always the case, but, <laughs> but in a sense, it is. And actually, Krishna is there if we want it. But we have to actually want it. And when you, I actually was thinking the other day that, wow, all of a sudden, I, I may actually leave my body. What do I really, it's scary. I mean, do I really want to be in, just with Krishna? And I don't, I, I'm not, I don't know what that means. It's, 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 uh, I'm not ready. I don't know. I'm hoping. I'm trying. It, it's very, you know, it's like free falling. You just walk away from everything. I, I remember the, uh, Jamuna, Mataji, oh, I'm not supposed to say Mataji, but Jamuna, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, Ma, uh, 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 Jamuna was saying that when Harin Gurdas came to Vrindavan before Prabhupada, they went to his room in Radhamadar 
And they went through everything, got everything separated and cleaned. And then prop and they said we found all these uh, letters and correspondence and and other writings and Prabhupada said, now okay, put them all together and now burn them. He said, but Prabhupada, I mean, there's some, maybe you should want to look at it. He said, burn them. Fortunately, I think Guru Das kept one or two things out. That's why we have a copy of a couple of poems that Prabhupada wrote. But Prabhupada wanted them all burnt. I, and I think about it all the time. The things that I have, I can't even approach them. I mean, Kalman's always telling me I have to clean up that one area over there. And it's just, I can't even approach it. And just burn it. Just burn it all. Get rid of it. Because otherwise, if I left my body, who cares? You know, nobody cares about some, you know, correspondence with my aunt or something like that. They just throw it away. Don't burn it. Who cares? You know, a picture of my dog. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, I veered off. Did I finish that purport? I didn't finish the I'm not the purple, but the paragraph. Um, I think I, I think there's one part more of the. Uh, uh, persons with a great, with a poor fund of knowledge do not know this, and therefore they have the audacity to deride him. Yeah, I've read this because he comes before us as the causeless mercy occasionally as a human being by his covenant. The Lord is not like a human being. He is such a Nanda Vigraha or the absolute personality of God. And there's no difference between his body and his soul. He is both the power and the powerful. There's still a very long power paragraph that's left. Does anyone else have anything to say? I thought of something from the first part you were talking about how like, little boys see things behind it. They want to know what's behind the thing, why it works. Right. And uh, it's like, like Lord Rama, or uh, Marimuni also. Wanted to know what was behind his father, Lord Brahma. Because you created everything. And yet you're meditating on somebody, so there must be something behind you. Right. So you wanted to know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's something similar to that. With, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a quick question. Yes. I wanted to know what Prabhupada told John Lennon. What? What did, what did Prabhupada tell John Lennon? About being together being forever? <laughs> He said, it's impossible. It's not possible. He said, don't think like that. We are all together forever in the spiritual world. But we're not these identities. We don't know who we are. We know what we're not. Um, and we all have, yes? Okay. Just make a statement when, when you said that we were on a safari once, uh, a party from coming home one time in uh, by the yoga peak, and um, oh gosh, the Vindasuri Purple was there, and he was saying that uh, Sri Prabhupada said that there is an ISKCON in the spiritual world. He right. said, and I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing that, yeah. Well, when I first heard it, though, it was in a letter back in 72, 73. It was so, like, wow, he's gone to the spiritual world. Yeah. But there's no GBCs. <laughs> no one knows his name. No one knows this. Anyway, uh, I apologize for my meandering. I didn't finish the bird board. Should I read it all? No? It's getting late. So, uh, anyway, thank you very much for your patience. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.